There are there are three handouts. There are three handouts wending their way around the uh, you know, across the room. So make sure you get all three. If you don't, not a big deal. It sh you should be able to download the PDF file right off the website. Okay. So one says syllabus, the second says projects, and the third is kind of the notes for the first two or three, or the first two sessions or so. Okay. So, so first, let's make sure you're in the right class. This is uh, valuation, I think. Okay. And there's a little bit of a history to this class. Um, this class actually has been around only five years, at least on paper. But about 26 years ago, when I came to NYU, I wanted to teach a class on valuation. And I talked to somebody in the department who'd been around a long time, and they said, don't do it. There isn't enough stuff in valuation to teach a class. And you know what? In the mid-'80s, that was absolutely true. I remember in my MBA, we spent, I think, all of two hours on valuation. And all I learned was the Gordon growth model. First seen that model? It's a stable growth dividend discount model. It's cruel and unusual punishment to turn people loose there saying, hey, you can value companies using a Gordon growth model. So in 86, when I came in and said, I want to teach a class on valuation, they said, don't do it. And they offered me a different class. It's a class called Equity Instruments and Markets. And I'll make a confession. I am not that interested in either instruments or markets. And I'm not even sure I'm interested in equity. It's kind of tough to teach a class where three of the four words disappear and all you're left with is ant. So I decided to be subversive. So what I did was I took over that class and I made it a valuation class. They never knew. They have no idea what's going on in the classroom anyway. But 20 years later, they discovered I'd converted the class to a valuation class, and they decided to rename it. So if you go back, this class has actually been around 25 years. For the first 20 years, it operated under false pretenses as an equity instruments and markets class. So this is the 25th year we're doing this class. So if you're not interested in valuation, this is not the place you should be, because all we're going to talk about is valuation, valuation, and more valuation for the next 15 weeks. So let's get the show on the road. I have uh, this particular semester, I don't have any TAs, partly because there isn't anybody within 20 miles of me who is a student at Stern who's taken this class. I've had actually people offered to be TAs or in the class. And I think that's kind of a touchy scenario, right? You're the TA for the class and in the class. So I have no TAs, which basically means if you have a question on this class, you either have to talk to somebody else in the class or you have to find me. So let me give you the clues as to how to find me. My office is right upstairs, 996, in this building. Okay. I've listed a phone. I, I used to list a phone number. I've taken it out because I never answer my phone, so it's kind of pointless leaving it in there. The best way to get in touch with me is to email me. So my email address is there. And my office hours are just before this class, 9.45 to about 10.20, and just after this class. But I'm going to make a very strange suggestion. If you have a question about this class, Trying to find me during office hours is probably the worst time to ask a question, because other people will have administrative issues. So, so if you have a question about this class, then the fair game principle applies. Those of you in my corporate finance class remember the fair game principle, right? Does somebody want to remind me what the fair game principle is? If you find me, I'm fair game. So the name of the game for me is for you to not find me. Actually not. I, I'm around most of the time. You can find me Monday through. Friday, I keep academic hours. Know what those are? I come in when I want. I leave when I want. I kind of come in a little late, around 10. So don't try to find me at 8. I'm not here. And definitely don't drop by my office after the sun set. I'm gone. I'm like a vampire. If I'm around here, I might change form. So best thing to do if you, if, if you have a question is find me outside of office hours. I'm usually around. Knock on my door if the door is locked. And if I'm in, I will open the door. I will answer your questions. So let's talk about this class. When I say valuation, different things float into people's minds. And for most people, when you say valuation, the first thing they think about is valuing stocks. As an investor, that's what this class is about. That's part of what this class is about, but it's more than that. Okay. We're going to look at valuation through lots of different lenses. In fact, I'm going to categorize all of the valuation models and metrics and approaches you see out there into three broad buckets. 
The first bucket I'm going to call intrinsic valuation. You value an asset based on its specific characteristics, its growth, its risk. So you value an asset based on its fundamentals. Discounted cash flow valuation is one manifestation of intrinsic valuation. So we're going to start with that, because that's going to lay the foundation for how we think about valuation. Then we're going to move on to what I call relative valuation, but a better name for it is probably pricing. You know the contrast between valuation and pricing? When I ask you to value something, you have to value it from the ground up. If I ask you to price something, what's the easiest way to price it? Let's say you have US Open tickets to this Friday's US Open. You want to sell it. You're trying to figure out how much to ask for those tickets. What do you do? What's the best way to price those tickets? You could try to value those tickets, but it's kind of pointless, right? So what are you going to do? You're going to stub up and see what other tickets in that same section are said. This isn't rocket science. And you know what? 90% of what passes for valuation out there in investment banks, in portfolio management firms, is really pricing. One of the things we're going to, you know, one of the companies that's obviously going to roll through this class because it's like a soap opera is Facebook. The IPO, the pricing of the IPO, the post IPO. And I think a lot of people look at Facebook, how could Morgan Stanley have got the valuation so wrong? They're asking the wrong question. Morgan Stanley never valued Facebook. They priced Facebook. The bigger question is, how did they get the pricing so wrong? It's one thing to get valuation wrong, to get pricing wrong, especially for a company like Facebook that's been priced for two years prior to the IPO. Is how could you get the pricing wrong? And that's the line we're going to jump back and forth across, because it's a very gray line. So you might tell me you're valuing something, but if I dig a little deeper, I might discover you just priced it. You haven't valued it. So when we talk about relative valuation, we're talking about valuing something based on how other things are being priced out there. And embedded in here are things we have to deal with. What's a similar asset? What's a comparable asset? The US Open tickets were easy. All I have to do is find another seat pretty close to the seat I'm trying to sell. But if I ask you to value Microsoft, all you have to do is find 10 companies just like Microsoft, right? Good luck to you. Relative valuation is really pricing. And 90% of what passes for valuation out there is really pricing. And there's very little in valuation that I can think of that is new and different. Much of what we're going to say about valuation has been known for decades. If there's anything that's new and different in valuation, it's the application of option pricing models, not to value options, that's been around 40 years, but to value businesses. A young biotechnology company, natural resource company, there are elements of options there that we, that we can bring in. This is what falls under the rubric of real options. So broadly speaking, you give me a valuation approach. The first thing I'm looking at is which bucket should I put it? Is it an intrinsic valuation? Is it relative valuation? Is it real options? And I'm going to try as best as I can to not make it dogmatic. Dogmatic in what sense? I'm not going to tell you intrinsic valuation is the only way to go. These other ways are bad ways of doing. They're just different ways. That doesn't mean I won't let you see my biases. My biases, I'll tell you up front, are towards intrinsic valuation. But I'd be a fool to not understand pricing or real options if they can help me value something and make money off it more. So we're going to talk about valuation approaches, and that's going to stretch across. We're going to value pretty much everything on the face of the earth. We're going to start out with publicly traded companies. Why? Because they're easy to value. The, the information is there. Easy to value in the sense that the information is accessible. You can look at an annual reports, 10 Ks, 10 Qs, filings. But we're not going to stop there. We're going to value private businesses. We're going to value developed market companies and emerging market companies. In fact, I'm not even going to draw that line. Because the minute you draw that line, you start people thinking about, are there different valuation approaches for emerging market companies? So I'm going to go back and forth across companies. And I'm not going to say, this is an emerging market company. I'm going to throw all my rules out of the window. I'm going to use the same valuation approaches for public and private companies, small and large companies, developed and emerging market companies. And along the way, we'll hit and run. We won't deal with in depth assets that might not fit into the rubric of businesses. What's the value of gold? How do you value gold? 
I mean, obviously, it's a big asset. There are people who have 20%, 30%, 80% of their portfolios invest in gold. Can you value gold? So we're going to talk about valuing just about any asset. So at the end of this class, my hope is that you have the tools and the techniques to value any asset that you're faced up with, whether it's a small business or a large business, whether it's a single asset or a mix of assets. And we're also going to look at valuation of the same company through different eyes. So what the heck is he talking about? What's the value of Procter & Gamble? So we can value the company. What's the value of Procter & Gamble to Bill Ackman? Have you been reading that story? Bill Ackman is an activist investor who's taken a position in Procter & Gamble. Does he have a different estimate of value than you and I? And if so, why? And what is he going to do about it? So we're going to talk about how value for the same asset, the same business, can be different through different eyes, through investors' eyes, through managers' eyes, through activist investors' eyes, through inside investors and outside investors. We're going to talk about shades of differences in value. And in the process, we'll also talk about specific scenarios where valuation might need to be tweaked. Notice the word I use, tweak, not changed. You're valuing a company for an acquisition. Are the rules any different? So we're going to talk about valuation from pretty much every perspective, every approach, every type of business. And if you don't see a particular business or, or an asset that, that you would like to see valued, bring it up in class. There will be a point in time we can say, how about something like this? How would we value some, uh, this particular asset? In terms of the structure of this class, I have some good news and I have some bad news. The good news is most of you have already laid the foundation for this class, or should have. How many of you took corporate finance from me? Okay. But I'm also a realist. I know that most of you spent the summer forgetting everything we did in corporate finance. It's like it goes into short-term memory, it's gone. So I'm going to assume nothing. So if you remember all of corporate finance, the bad news is the first third of this class will seem like review, and it is. Because I want to go back and revisit that foundation. You cannot revisit it often enough. So the first third of the class, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to lay out this session and the next session. We're going to lay the foundation, the different approaches, where they come from, what the pros and cons are, a big picture perspective of intrinsic valuation, relative valuation, real option. Then we're going to spend about Eight, seven or eight sessions kind of revisiting basics. How do we measure risk and bring it into discount rates? What is the cash flow? How do we estimate growth? How, what do we do at the end of year five or year 10 when we stop estimating growth? So those are the input numbers, and you're going to get really impatient with me because until session 10, you're not going to see a full-fledged valuation. You're going to see pieces of companies. You're going to see me estimate growth for Coca-Cola. You might see me estimate cost of capital for Embraer. But those sessions essentially are critical sessions because we're, we're laying the foundation for the numbers that go into valuation. And then once we've laid the foundations, we can have fun. Fun in what sense? This might sound sick, but we can value real companies. We're going to spend a couple of sessions valuing about 20 companies that range the spectrum from easy companies to difficult companies, from cyclical to non-cyclical from new economy to old economy. And in the process, you're going to see how much of valuation stays constant as you move across different kinds of companies. So that will take us almost halfway through the semester. And that's going to be the intrinsic valuation part. Much of it's spent on the inputs in the intrinsic valuation. But once you have the inputs, you can fly with them. Then we're going to turn our attention to pricing. As I said, 90% valuations out there are pricing. And once you graduate, assuming you get a job, and I will assume 100% of you will get a job, if you're involved in valuation, whether you like it or not, the bulk of your job is pricing, which means you need to be able to do relative valuation right, which is a fancy way of saying you need to be able to use multiples and comparables. So if I ask you, how would you use EV to EBITDA and these 15 companies to value this company, you need to be able to do that. So we're going to spend about five sessions talking about how to do pricing or relative valuation right. So if I came to you with a company or an asset, how do you do relative valuation right? So that's going to take us through about two-thirds of the class. And then we're going to turn our attention to real options. And here we have a problem. 
before you start talking about applying real options, you've got to revisit, you've got to get your basic option pricing nailed down. I won't embarrass you by putting you on the spot saying, do you remember binomial option pricing models or Black-Scholes option pricing models? But we're going to spend about 45 minutes doing a very quick review of the basics of option pricing. And then we're going to jump in and start applying those models on different businesses where they can be useful in valuing those businesses. Then in the last two, two or three sessions, we'll talk about applying all of these tools to specific scenarios, in particular valuing acquisitions. And what I'm going to you know, generically call value enhancement, basically the question I'm asking is, if I came to you with a business, not a very well-run HP, and I said, what would you change about this business to make it a more valuable business? What are the levers that you can move to change the value of a company? And somewhere in the middle, we will slip in a couple of sessions on valuing private businesses. And by private businesses, I'm not talking about the car deals and the coke industries of the world. Those are really public companies that operate as private businesses. I'm talking about the hot dog stand outside. Notice the guy bought a new <coughs> car. He used to be outside. And, and you know, that was a huge investment for him. I asked him how much. He has borrowed money up to the hill to buy that car. It cost him $50,000. What is that hot dog stand worth? Now that he has six other stands that seem to have come out of nowhere that try to sell exactly what he sells, is the value of his hot dog stand less or more? So we're talking about businesses from really small businesses to really large businesses. But we want to talk about what's different about valuing a small private business where you might be the owner. It's a little late for preseason prep. But you have the weekend to catch up, right? There are only three things that I need you to know to get this class under your belt. First, I need you to be able to read accounting statements. I don't care whether you can do debit credit accounting. Frankly, I, could, I can't do debit credit accounting. It bores the heck out of me. But I want you to be able to read a financial statement. I need you to be able to tell me what the difference is between operating income and net income. What goes in them? So it's really. When I talk about accounting, I need you to kind of have the basics of financial statements nailed down. I have a very quick primer of about seven or eight pages on the items that I care about in a financial statement. So you, know, you can go and read that primer if you want. But if you have your accounting book, kind of scan through it. Because this is something you're going to run into all through the class. Why? Because our raw material for valuation comes from accounting. I'm going to dump on accountants all through this class with no shame at all. But the reality is I am dependent on accountants supplying me with the raw data to value companies. If I don't understand accounting statements, I'm going to be in big trouble. Second, basic statistics. Basic statistics in the sense of you know the, you know the, 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 if I give you a distribution, you can give me the key statistics for that distribution. Again, being able to read statistics is more critical than being able to do the statistics itself. So if I gave you a regression, can you make sense of what that regression is telling you? Because again, it's a tool we're going to draw on in valuation all through this class. And finally, very basic finance. Very basic finance in the sense, can you do present value? You say, I'm a second year MBA. Of course I know present value. I know you worn out that PV button on your calculator, but can you really do present value? Okay. So I want you to think about what goes behind that present value button and think about you know, what you need to learn about. Because ultimately, valuation is a huge present value problem. If you have trouble with the present value of an annuity still, you're not quite ready to kind of take the next step. So go back and review basic present value. And if you've forgotten all of corporate finance, kind of very quickly review at least the big parts of corporate finance. Okay? Big parts in the sense, how do you measure risk, capital budgeting, capital structure, dividend policy, kind of scan through it. Okay? Now I'm going to harass you, just as I did in corporate finance. All, But I'm going to give you a planned harassment schedule, so you know exactly what harassment will happen every day of the week. Okay? So Monday and Wednesday are, of course, class days. And here's how every class will begin outside of this one. Every class is going to begin with a quiz. 
freaked out already, right? Don't worry, it's not a graded quiz. So it's a quiz. It'll cover the material we're going to do in the class. It's kind of backwards, right? Basically, what I want to do is get your priors on the table before we start talking about the concept. Because I, much of this is common sense. And you're going to be amazed at how much you figure out even before we talk about it. So every class, we're going to start with a five-minute pre-class quiz that will cover the material for the class. Here's what the rest of the week will come look like. Every Tuesday for the next 14 weeks, I'll put a valuation up. I'll tell you what's coming for the next three weeks. Next week, I'm going to put up my valuation at Facebook from last week. So put up my valuation. This is not just the number. I'm going to put up my Excel spreadsheet with my assumptions. And I'm going to create a shared Google spreadsheet. And here's what I'd like you to do. Again, no, it's not graded. You can choose not to do it. I, I'm, I'm not going to kind of hold a gun to your head. Okay? But it's a five or 10 minute exercise. I want you to go into my spreadsheet. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Take a look at my assumptions and disagree with me. I don't like that growth rate. I don't like that discount rate. I don't like, no, whatever it is you disagree with me, enter your numbers, come up with your valuation, enter it to the shared spreadsheet. I'd like to see 160 valuations of Facebook on that shared spreadsheet next week. The week after, I'm going to put up my valuation of the iPhone franchise. This is to kind of synchronize with the iPhone being released. Last week, I actually valued the, I put it on my blog for, for those of you who read my blog. I valued the franchise at about $300 billion. And I have a spreadsheet there. I want you to go in and make your assumptions about the franchise. So each week, I'll put up a valuation. And it's, you're going to say, that's not fair. We haven't done the class yet. How are we going to do these valuations? Initially, here's what's going to happen. You're going to look at a number and say, well, I don't feel comfortable changing that number. So you're going to tweak my numbers. Not very much. You're going to make sure that I, you stay pretty close to my number, because then if you're wrong, I'm wrong too. And that's always a consoling factor. As you go through this class, your confidence should build up. That's what valuation is about, feeling confident enough that you can say, look, I think this business is worth more or less than what the rest of the market does, and I'm willing to do something about it. But that confidence doesn't come from you coming in here and me talking to you, but from you doing these valuations. So every week for the next 14 weeks, I'll put up a valuation. As we go through the semester, let's see if the valuations get richer. So it's going to be almost valuation by committee as we go through. And we'll see what that consensus number looks like as we go through this class. So every week, you'll see evaluation will come out on Tuesday. Wednesday, of course, is a class. Right after the class, I'll send out what's called a weekly challenge. Again, it's not graded. You can choose not to do it. You can choose to do it. Okay? What this will do is it'll take the topic for that week that we covered and kind of take it one step further. To me, the, you know, the, 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 the test of whether you can do valuation is whether you can take all those concepts that we talk about in class and kind of extend it into, into places where the answer might not be clear. So the weekly challenges kind of stretch you. They stretch you in terms of, do you really get it? You might get the material, but can you use it? Can you apply it to answer this question? So you'll have about 12 weekly challenges. Now, I think I, I, I skipped the Thanksgiving week, and I'll skip the last week. And each week, you, you'll have a weekly challenge. It comes out on Wednesday. The, the answer to the weekly challenge is usually due by Sunday. And again, as I said, I'm not keeping tabs on, on. Actually, I am keeping tabs, tabs of whether you did the weekly challenge. But I'm not grading it. So I'm not looking at the answer. This guy did nine weekly challenges. I'm going to push his grade up. It's really, I mean, it's intended for you if you want to kind of extend your evaluation on. Thursday, I'll send you an email about the project. You're saying, what project? We'll talk about it. Don't worry. You will think about it for the next 14 weeks. So we'll, we'll get started soon. Friday, there's nothing scheduled yet. That's your day of rest. Okay. Saturday, you'll get a weekly newsletter. Not this week, because not much will happen this week. But starting next Saturday, and this isn't fancy. I'm not going to put some 15-page newsletter. This basically tells you where we are in the class, in terms of where we're in the lecture notes, where we're going next, and maybe a few links and notes about what we did during the week. That'll be. So it's a five, two-minute read, three-minute read, so there's newsletters. And Sunday, I'll put up the solution to the weekly challenge so you can see what your solution was and compare it. Again, this is not about whether you got it right. So this 
So you, it's up to you to check against the solution to see if you got the same answer. And if you did not, and you don't quite get why my answer is different, then of course we can chat about it. So that's basically the schedule for the next 14 weeks. As for class, because we have that pre-class quiz every session, I'd like you to be here at 10.30. So this, uh, the quiz is going to be 10.30 because, I mean, obviously, if I let that slip, then sooner or later it's going to start spilling too much into the class time. So please be here, and please be here at 10.30. If you, if you can't make it at 10.30, you have to show up at 10.40. I'd rather have you here than not here, so don't not show up simply because you missed the first 10 minutes. But if you can make it at 10.30, great. Bring your lecture note packet with you. I mean, the emails are sent out. Are you guys getting all of my, both my, did you get both my emails? Okay. If you're not getting my emails, let me know. If you're in the class, you should be getting the email, but there's a, the email list is kind of in transition. I don't know what's going on you know, with the email list. So. If, it, if you're not getting it, let me know. But bring your lecture notes to class. Okay? And please don't keep going downstairs and printing off the lecture notes before each class, because then I hear about it. You know what I mean, right? Don't go down to the printer and say, I'm going to print off the next 25. But if you can bring the lecture notes, that'll, that'll help during the class. If you do miss a class, please catch up. And I'll make it easy for you to catch up. Just as with the corporate finance class, I'll put up the webcast for the class, about 30 to 40. This class actually is faster than Shimmel Shimmel. They took forever to get the webcast on. Here, within 30 to 45 minutes, the webcast will be up. And it'll be in three formats. One will be a direct stream, for which basically you need an inter internet server. You need to be connected. You can also download it as a video file, M4V file, which you can watch on whatever video device you want, iPad, iPhone, whatever. And it'll also, there'll also be an audio version. I'm also going to put the webcast in two other places. One is on the lower side that you know, used to be called Course Kit, you know, which, I, which you might have got the invitation to yesterday. So you'll see the webcast show up there. It's also going to show up on Apple iTunes U. So I'll send the link to that, you know, which means if you have an iPad or an iPhone you know, connected to iTunes U, you can download it there. So there's no excuse for missing a class, even if you're Two, you know, if you're, you know, two continents away, you should be able to keep up with the class. If you have to miss a week, if you have to miss ten days, make sure at least you watch those webcasts and keep up with the class. As for books, I'll tell your friend you can live without a book. You'll be perfectly fine without it. But if you do, so it's purely option. Okay, so here are your choices. Okay. The, the choice, actually, that should be third edition. I'm sorry, fix that. It should be third edition. You can, the book that makes the most sense for this class, because it's designed as a textbook, is the investment valuation book. The third edition should be in the bookstore. You can get it from Amazon. It's about 50. They're actually, it, in th this reflects, I think, the strangeness of the publishing business. There are two different editions of the book. One is hardcover. One is paperback. Now, if you are, if you, from a common sense perspective, which one do you think should cost more? Hardcover, right? One is a university edition. The other is for everybody else. Now, you've gone to college long enough to know that this is a racket. Guess which one costs more? The university edition always costs more. They're exactly the same book. Absolutely every single word. Hey, they tried to get me to take problems out of one. I said, no, it's the same book. So my advice to you is buy the cheapest version of the third edition you can find, even if it's a Chinese version or a, I don't care if it's a pirated version or if you just, you know, whatever. I don't want to get myself into too much trouble here. Okay. Okay. But if you have the, so the book that makes the most sense is the third edition. I also have a book on valuation that's really not a textbook. It's for practitioners which is kind of focused in on what I call the loose ends in valuation. What I'm talking about are things like control premiums, liquidity. The modern valuation, the second edition, kind of the second half of the, that book is about valuing all those special things that show up in valuation after the fact. If you have to pick a book, my choice would actually be the dark side of valuation. Because much of the material for the class, you get in the lecture notes, the dark side of valuation is really about stretching yourself, about valuing difficult to value companies. Anybody can value a simple company. You know what a simple company is? It's a company with a long history. It's making money. My 13-year-old could value that company. 
I could teach him enough valuation in two hours to value that company. It's valuing difficult companies, commodity companies, cyclical companies, companies that are losing money. That's where you get tested. So the dark side of valuation is about valuing difficult to value companies. And finally, if you don't want to spend very much money, they have a little book, and it's really a little book of valuation, okay, which is about $10, $12, which basically covers the basics of valuation. But as I said, you don't need any of these books. If you choose to buy a book, go ahead. I will never talk about the book in class. I will use the lecture notes. And the book is really to kind of buff, buffer up what you do in class, add to those details. I also have a valuation app that I co-developed with a friend of mine, Anand Sundaram, who teaches at Dartmouth, called Uvalue. So if you go to the iTunes store, it's, um, it's, it's an app that allows you to, val to do discounted cash flow valuation and basic relative valuation of companies. Okay? It's actually a pretty versatile app. You can value money losing companies, growth companies, mature companies. And the price is right. It's free, so it's it comes with a money back guarantee. You don't like it. Okay, but if you have an iPad or an iPhone, you can download the app and play with it. You know? So you can use it to kind of value those companies that I throw out there in the next week, the week after. So you can download the app and try it out. If you have an Android, tough. We haven't written an Android version yet. It turns out to be a lot more work than we thought. So maybe someday in the future. If you have a BlackBerry, forget about it. <laughs> it's a dead technology walking. I don't aim to feed that dead technology. So you know, if you have a BlackBerry, get rid of the BlackBerry. That's my advice. Yeah. So, so try it out if you want. It's actually a fun app to play with. It's a, you know, so you can, especially in the iPhone, it's real fun because it's, you know, it's, even though it's a small screen, you can see all the inputs and play with. Now, as I said, even if you choose not to stay connected, I'm going to make sure you stay connected. So of course. The central site for this class will be the, the, the website that I sent the link to. So that's really the place you should go where everything will get, will get posted. Every email I'll send you will be on that site in, in archive form. So you can go in and see every email that's come. So again, there's no excuse for you saying, no, I didn't get that email on September 23rd. It's there. Okay? So I'm taking away every potential excuse you can have. There's a Google Calendar for the class, which if you click, you will see every, you know, all the sessions laid out by topic. It also tells you when the quizzes are. So no surprises. So don't act all surprised when I say there's a quiz next week. It's been on the calendar since July, actually. Okay? So it lists out the quizzes. The final exam for this class is December 14th, 10 to 12. Those of you who want to make your, phone, you know, your plane reservations, whatever to go, get home, it's nailed down. As I said, you don't have to read my blog. My blog is entirely about valuation. But if you are interested in reading about kind of riffs I have on valuation, visit my blog. Twi my Twitter feed, of course, I'll tell you what's on the blog, so you don't have to. You, you hear from me now. And if there's other readings, you'll see them listed on my website. Basically, other readings are not serious stuff. It's for really from the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times. You know, readings relating to the topic. So it's pretty light stuff. It's usually, you know, two minutes you can scan through the article. Now for the unpleasant part. There will be a grade for the class. It's not a pass, no pass class in case you know. And here's what I try to base my grading on. At the end of this class, if you can value just about anything, then you deserve an A. So my test is to figure out whether I can push you to the limit and you can do it. If you can value most things, that's pretty good. 90% of things. So you can't value that Picasso. I'll let that go. Okay? So that's the BB plus. Is if you can value some things, I don't know how much you've, this class has helped you advance. Maybe you could value nothing before you valued some things. <laughs> it's not bad, but it's really not what I was hoping for. At the end of class, you can value nothing. And this class clearly has been useful. So my job is to see if I can test you on your capacity to value assets not on whether you remember an equation, a theory, or a model. I want you to be able, to, at the end of this class, if I came to you and asked you, can you value my business, to be able to put a number on. So here's the process by which I will try to make that judgment. As a project I will talk about, this is the project that will run through the entire semester, where you pick a company and essentially track it through the entire semester, just like your corporate finance project. But the focus here will be different. This is all about valuing that company rather than digging up the capital structure, dividend policy aspect, which you did in corporate finance. 
So I'll talk a little bit about that, about that project in a couple of minutes. So that's worth 30%. That's a group project. Okay. There will be a second project that's a mystery. What will the mystery be? I don't know. It might be evaluation of Apple. It might be evaluation of Procter. It'll be, it might be, you know, it, it depends very much on what the news of the moment is. I'll pick something that seems newsworthy in the middle of the, in the semester. Uh, that'll be a much shorter project, kind of testing you on a, on a particular piece of evaluation. And here are the, the, the individual work part of the class. There'll be three quizzes. The three sessions are listed out here. Each of the quizzes is 30 minutes. It's open book, open notes in the first 30 minutes of class. Notice it's not the middle 30 minutes. It's not the last 30 minutes. So those days in particular, you have to show up on time. Otherwise, you'll miss a chunk of the quiz. And the quizzes will basically be non-cumulative. They'll cover the previous eight, seven or eight sessions. So they'll kind of take you through the class. The final exam, of course, is cumulative. It'll cover everything in this class. It'll be a two-hour final. So that's about 50%. That's, that's going to basically be 60% of your grade. 40% comes from your group project. Those of you who are in my corporate finance class know the quiz rules, but you seem to forget them even while you are in the corporate finance class. So I want to be very clear about what the rules of the quiz are so that nobody's confused. First, because of the size of this class, there will be no moving quizzes. So basically, the quizzes will be in the days designated. There will not be any surprises. All quizzes will be open book, open notes. You can bring in as much stuff as you want. You can bring in all four of my books. They're not going to help you at all. But if it makes you feel more comfortable, do it. Okay? Each quiz is worth 10%. If you have to miss a quiz for good reason, you know the good reasons are, right? You're sick. Your spouse is sick. Your children are sick. Somebody in your country is sick. No, that's no. Basically, it's, it's, it, it could be for health. It could be. I understand. You have interviews. You have jobs. So if it is something where, you know, if it's a good reason, then it's fine. Bad reasons would be I'm not prepared for the quiz. I don't feel ready yet. Those are not good reasons. If you miss a quiz for a good reason, here's what's going to happen. That 10% will get moved to whatever's left of the class. No strategic quiz mi missing. So basically, if you do really well in the first two quizzes, missing the third quiz will not help you because I'm not going to overweight the first two quizzes. It'll always go to what's left in the class. So you're saying, what do I lose by missing a quiz? What you lose is the following. If you take all three quizzes and the final, your worst quiz will get marked up to the average score on all of your remaining exams. All your exams, not just your. So as an example, let's say you got three on the first quiz. You got eight on the second quiz, eight on the third quiz, and 24 on the final. So basically, you got 80% on all of your remaining exams. I will take the three on the first quiz and make it make. So that's the option you get if you do all the quizzes. So my advice to you is, if you can do all the quizzes, do them, because that will give you that one, f I won't even say freebie, but one quiz where you can get that jump. And the, the degree of the jump will depend on how different that quiz is from the rest of your quizzes. Okay? As I said, there's no TA, so I don't know. I've never used a TA to grade quizzes anyway. So I will grade the quizzes. I will get it. No, I do give partial credit. I do make mistakes. If I screw up, bring the quiz in. I'll fix it. You can bring calculators to class. That goes without saying. For the moment, though, no laptops, no iPads, no device that can be connected for an obvious reason. If you, have, if you can connect the device, I have no way of controlling security. So I don't know who you're talking to, what, you know, what you're talking about. So as long as it's not a connected device, you can bring it in, which basically means it's a pen, paper, or calculator. There'll be nothing there that requires tremendous math. So you, know, you, should, be, you should be OK. Any questions on the logistics of the class? Let's put the. Let's let me talk a little bit about the gr group project. And before I do that, though, on, on a couple of things about the groups. The groups you have to pick your own group. So start looking around and thinking about the people you want to work with, and also the people that you don't want to work with. And those lists should be starting to build up in your mind if you've been around. You know, yeah, it's first year experience. You've worked in groups before. So pick your own group. That way, if the group doesn't work, you can't blame me. So I'm not going to assign anybody to your group. I'm not going to assign you to anybody's group. So if you're not, if you can't find a group, let me know, because I'll do the same thing I did in corporate finance. You know what I did? Basically, I'll create an orphan list and put you up for adoption. 
And if the list gets long enough, then you can create your own group out of the orphan list. So whatever needs to happen. So you will ultimately find a group. Yeah? There'll be one grade per group, so please don't come in and negotiate with me and say, I did all the work in the group. Can you give me an A and all the rest of the... It doesn't work that way. Everybody gets the same grade. That's the way life works. I know that there'll be an unequal amount of work done within a group. That's the nature of this process. Nothing you can do about it. And the quizzes and exams, you know, ba basically, you know, the rules are laid out. So let's move to the project and very quickly at least list out what the project is going to be about. project very simply is just applying every single valuation approach, metric, model that we have in class to a company. So here's what I'd like you to start thinking about right now. Think about a company you'd like to value. And unlike corporate finance, we had to be structured to stay within a sector within the group. You can pick any company you want. So if you're interested in Facebook, maybe. don't worry about me valuing the same company. It doesn't matter. I, w I might value 35 companies, and one of those companies might be yours. It shouldn't matter in the least, because 20 people can value the same company. They're not going to come up with the same answer. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to start with a group. Each of you is going to pick a company. So let me be very specific. If you have a group of five, you'll have five companies. If you have a group of seven, you'll have seven companies. Okay. Try to group to keep the group size to a size that you can live with. Okay. I think once you get to about seven or eight, you're hitting the upper end. If you get to about three, you're starting to hit the lower end. So decide for yourself whether it's four or five. You know, my guess is four or five is probably the optimal size for a group but I'll let you make that judgment. Here's what's different about this group project as opposed to the corporate finance project. The corporate finance project, you pick the company, and basically there was nothing due till the very last day of class. I harassed you all the way through. Where are you in the project? But I never checked in on where you were. That I've discovered is a terrible mistake for second year MBAs. Because somewhere in the middle of the semester, you check out sometimes. So sometimes to keep that from happening, I'm going to require that a portion of the project be turned in midway through. Not for grading, but for feedback. And I'll tell you to talk about which portion, the discounted cash flow evaluation of your company. I'd like to see on October 26th, so the final project is due on the last day of class, which is December 12th, but it's due at 5 p.m. The class is actually 10.30, 12, but the end of that day. Okay. Here's the only constraint I'm going to impose within each group. So if you have a group of five, each of you can go pick whatever company you want as long as you meet these constraints and they're not difficult to meet. At least one of you has to pick a money-losing company. Why? Because I really don't think that you've learned to do valuation until you've valued a money-losing company. Because all the standard levers don't work with money-losing companies. At least one of you has to pick a money-losing company. At least one of you has to pick a company with high growth potential either in revenues or earnings. Okay. At least one of you has to pick a non-US company and value it in the local currency. No, no cheating. No picking an ADR and doing it in US dollars. I want you to deal with risk-free rates and rupee and rupees and reais and pesos. So I want you to value the local currency. And there's got to be at least one non-manufacturing company. You know, so it can be a financial service company. It can be a retail firm, whatever. So this is if you have a group of five, somehow you've got to meet these constraints. You think that takes away four out of the five? Not necessarily, right? If you can find that one unlucky person in your group and give him the money losing high growth foreign service company, you got the whole thing nailed down. So keep that aside for that last person who wants to join your group. You say, OK, you can join my group, but this is what you have to do. But I'll tell you something. You know, there are no boring companies to value. But the more challenges you face in valuation, the more you learn out of the process. So my suggestion is think out of the box. Think about a company you'd really like to value that might present challenges. Okay. So, yeah. And if, you're, if you have no idea what companies are losing money and what companies have, I mean, of course, you can do your own homework, go to Capital IQ, do screens. I just did the screens yesterday on Capital IQ on all companies globally that have negative net income and negative EBITDA. La the last 12 months. I've the, so if you go into my, into my website, you'll actually see that entire Excel spreadsheet with, with the money-losing companies or high-growth companies. You're not constrained to stay with just that list. 
But if you want to start with that list and kind of scan through that list looking for an interesting company, then you can go ahead. Once you pick the company, you are going to do a discounted cash flow valuation of that company. And my advice to you it is don't wait till we're in session 12 to do it. Do it in process while we're going through in class. So when we talk about risk-free rates in class, it will be session 3 or session 4. Try to get a risk-free rate in your local currency. When we talk about equity risk premiums in session 5, try to come up with an equity risk premium for your company. When we talk about cost of equity and cost of capital for companies and how to estimate them, try to do that for your company. When we talk about cash flows, try to estimate. So as we go through each input, try it out in your company. First, it'll cement what we talk about in class. Second, it'll make your final valuation much easier to do. Because by the time you get to session 10 or 11, you've got all the numbers nailed down. Right? And don't feel queasy about switching company. Because once you've done it with one company, repeating that process for another company is not that complicated. So you can switch companies if you want to. You're not stuck with the company you pick up front. So what I'm trying to do is, rather than spend the next five weeks tormenting yourself about what the right company is. Pick a company right away, start working on it, because you can always change company midstream. You're not stuck with that company. So what you're going to do is do a discounted cash flow valuation. You're going to send me the Excel spreadsheet with your DCF valuation on October 25th. That's all you're going to send me. No big detailed write-up. What I will do is I'll go through your Excel spreadsheet with a diagnostic sheet. Basically what I'll do is I'll put comments on inputs that I either don't get or I think are internally inconsistent. I think, what's he talking about? One of the things I'm going to emphasize in this class is if you gave me a valuation and said, is this valuation right? I can't answer the question. Because who knows what right is? Your estimates could be different from mine about revenue growth and margins. But if you ask me, is this valuation internally consistent? I can answer that question. What I mean by internal consistency is you want a valuation that is not at war with itself. Your assumptions about risk your assumptions about growth, your assumptions about reinvestment have to be internally consistent. So if you tell me your company is high growth, but you tell me it gets there without reinvesting any money and low risk, I'm going to ask you, what's, what's the magic in this company? How is that pulling it? So that's what that mid-semester Excel spreadsheet will allow me to do, is give you some feedback on these two numbers don't seem to go with each other. So don't expect feedback like, I think your revenue growth is too low. Because this is your company. You know more about your company, or you should, by the middle of the semester than I will. So I'm going to defer to you on inputs, but I'm going to point out to you inputs that don't seem to be you know, consistent with each other. Once you've done your discounted cash flow evaluation, which will be somewhere in the middle of the semester, then I'm going to ask you to value a company relative to its sector. You know what I mean by relative to the sector? So I'm saying you have a software company. Does it look cheap given how other software companies are priced out there? So this is where you get to try out multiples and comparables. And essentially, you're going to do a relative valuation to the sector. Then I'm going to follow that up by asking you to value a company relative to the entire market. You say, what's different about that? Let me ask you a question. Can you have a company that looks cheap relative to its sector and expensive relative to the market? Let's take an example. Let's say you valued LinkedIn. What's the sector it's in? Social media companies, right? You could tell me that LinkedIn looks the cheapest of the social media companies. But then when you compare LinkedIn to the rest of the market, it could be much more expensive than the rest of the market. It's a different question I'm asking you. So I'm going to ask you, is your company cheap or expensive relative? It's a different perspective on relative valuation. Then when we get to towards the 12th or the 13th week, I'm going to ask you whether you can try an option pricing model in your company. And the answer is going to be for many of your companies, no, it doesn't work for my company. But for some of your companies, there's going to be a piece of the company you can value using option pricing. So by the time you get to the 13th or 14th week, you should have, at the minimum, two valuations of your company and potentially more than that. Right? You could have a discounted cash flow value for your company, a relative value for your company, maybe a real options value. With relative value, maybe you could have a value with a price earnings ratio, an EV to EBITDA, price to book ratio, which are all different. So you might have six different valuations, all of which are different, and all of which are different from the price. So I'm going to ask you to make up your mind. Now that you have all these numbers for your company in front of you that you've come up with, and you have a price at which you can buy this company, would you buy this company? or sell this company. Notice no middle Weasley middle grounds. 
No weak buys, semi-weak buys. Maybe I'll think about buying. Buy or sell. That's where this, uh, this process is, is leading up to, is that final judgment. And at that stage, you're going to come to me and say, which valuation should I use? My discounted cash flow valuation or my relative valuation? I'm, I'm going to turn the question back to you. You did these valuations. You have to make this decision. Which one of those valuations do you feel more comfortable with? And I'm not going to prejudge you, force you to do the intrinsic valuation. That's going to be your choice, given what you feel about your own valuation. So that's what the big project is. It essentially runs through the semester, applying every single part of valuation that we'll do in class. As for the mystery project, you'll have to stay a mystery till I kind of nail it down. But when it's ready, I'll kind of let you know. So around, it'll be after the, you know, maybe 10th week or 9th week, somewhere in there, you'll get the, the note from me. How many of you have bought your lecture note packets or done? Incidentally, if you, there are two ways you can get the lecture notes. One is you can buy the packet at the bookstore. How much did it cost you? $27, $27 which will make the bookstore richer. Good, 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 I, I guess. Or you can download it as a PDF file and either print it off. Or if you have an iPad or something, you can, I mean, if you want to save paper, that's fine. So there are two ways. So you don't have to buy the lecture notes. You can download them and but make sure you have the lecture notes in some form with you. I know most of you don't have your lecture notes yet. That's why I've made the lecture notes for this session and next session as, my, as a physical. These will be the last physical you know, packets that you will see. You'll get that quiz at the start of every session. I'll make a fit, but this is the last big packet you'll see. So that introduction to valuation is going to cover the rest of today's session and the second session. So here's what I'd like to use this to do. I'd like to lay, use this to lay a philosophical foundation for how I think about valuation, why I do valuation, and how I see these different valuation approaches. As I told you, when I first I, you know, I started, when I came here 26 years ago, I wanted to teach a valuation class. And when I first started teaching valuation, I made the mistake of assuming that everybody else was as interested in valuation as I was which I've discovered in hindsight was a terrible mistake. Because most people don't believe in valuation. By most people, I include most people who do valuation for a living. So I'd like to start off giving you the reason why I do valuation. I do valuation to fight the lemming in me. You heard of lemmings? It became famous or infamous in the 1950s when National Geographic filled the most amazing site. They filmed thousands of big, ugly, rat-like creatures gathered together on a cliff, run right off the cliff into an ocean, and commit collective suicide. Maybe it's urban legend, but it's a pretty good legend, right? It's fun to visualize that happening. Now, I don't know why they went off the cliff into the ocean, but let's do some virtual imagery to see what went on. You see why the first lemming did it, right? He's going too fast. He couldn't stop off the cliff into the ocean. Incidentally, these guys can't swim. That kind of seals the deal dead. Second lemming too close to the first guy off the cliff too. I'd like you to put yourself in the shoes of the very last lemming in that group. I know lemmings don't wear shoes, but can hang in there with the analogy anyway. You're running as fast as you can towards a cliff. You've seen your entire tribe disappear off that cliff. I would think you'd have second thoughts about what you were just planning to do. Your left brain, right brain, whatever part of you is rational saying, stop, 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 don't do it. But then you hear this voice, and you know what it's saying? They must know something that you don't. Remember those seven words in investing. They must know something that you don't. They're the seven most deadly words in investing. You know when you hear it? Let's say you sit down to value Apple. One of the most successful stories of the last decade, right? Stock that has gone up 60-fold. So you sit down to value Apple, you come up with $250 per share. What's the stock trading at right now? 660, right? So what's your rational side saying? Don't buy that stock, right? And then you hear this voice. They must know something that you don't. It speaks in a monotone. Don't ask me why. But when you hear that voice, magical things start happening to your valuation. You know what I'm talking about? Your growth rates start to go up. Your discount rates start to go down. 250 becomes 300, 350, 400, 450, 500. And you're not going to stop till you get to 660. 
Don't fight it. There's a learning inside each and every one of you dying to get out. Let it out. In fact, you can divide the whole world of investors into three groups of lemmings. The first group I call proud lemmings. I'm a lemming and I'm proud to be a lemming. You know who I'm talking about? They call themselves momentum investors, but it's pretty much the same thing, right? What do they do? They look for a crowd and they join in. You're buying, I'm buying. You're selling, I'm selling. Why are you buying? I don't care. I can't even imagine going up to somebody and saying, I'm a momentum investor. Might as well say, I'm a lemming and I'm proud to be a lemming. The second group I call Yogi Bear lemmings. Any of you watch that movie, the Yogi Bear movie that came out like two or three years ago? It's an abysmally bad movie. But I went to watch it anyway. Why? Because of Yogi Bear used to be one of my favorite comics when I was growing up. And I still remember his favorite expression. He said, smarter than the average bear. Yogi bear lemmings think they're smarter than the average lemming. You know what they want to do? They want to run with the crowd till the very last moment, at the very last moment, just as they get to the cliff, they want to veer away. They get all the upside of momentum and none of the downside. Admit it, you're tempted. You think, oh, I'm smarter than the average investor. I know where the cliff is coming. In case you're tempted, I'd remind you of the immortal words of Stanley Druckenmiller. He used to be George Soros' portfolio manager. And he got fired in 2000 for making a big bet on tech stocks that went bad. So the press conference, one of the reporters gets up and said, Mr. Druckenmiller, why did you buy all those tech stocks? Did you think they were cheap? He said, no, no, we knew they were overpriced when we bought them. I said, why did you buy them? Because we thought we could get out before the correction hit. He used some baseball terminology, but you can convert into lemming terminology. He said, we thought we were in the top of the eighth when, in fact, we're in the bottom of the ninth. If you have no idea what I'm talking about because you don't follow baseball, here's what he was saying in lemming terminology. He said, we thought we were five feet away from the cliff when, in fact, we were three feet past the cliff, at which point you turn and say, oh, my God, it was back there. The problem with trying to be smarter than the average lemming is you don't know where the cliff is coming. Don't let anybody tell you different. That's why after every crash, what do you hear? I could see it coming all that time. I knew it was going to happen. Then how come you never mentioned it? You're on CNBC every day for those five years? It slipped my mind. After the fact, it's always obvious. So I can't pull off being a proud lemming. I am not smarter than the average lemming. If you ask me to describe myself, that's me. A lemming with a life vest. That's all you can aspire to be. Don't set yourself standards like, I'm going to be a rational investor. That's an oxymoron. You're a human being. Biologically, you're already hardwired to do crazy things. And here's why. It's what allowed us to survive as human beings. If you were a caveman and you saw your entire cave community running towards you, what's the most logical thing for you to do? Not run in the opposite direction because odds are there's a mammoth behind them and you're going to get stomped, but to turn and run with them, right? That same impulse that leads you to join the crowd is what leads you to sell when everybody else is selling. You can talk about being a contrarian. It's easy to talk about it. But when you try to do it, every impulse you have is going to scream, no, no, run with everybody else. It's a survival impulse. All that valuation can do is not make you rational. Nothing can do that. It slows the process down. It allows your rational side to mount an argument. And nine times out of 10, you're going to ignore it and do whatever you wanted in the first place. But maybe that one time out of 10 where you listen to it, you might do something sensible. That's what valuation is. It's not about giving you the tools to be right every step of the way, but giving you the tools to think about what's on the other side of the equation. Giving you something to hold on to that's beyond just perception. Which brings me to a very interesting point about perception. There's a widely held view out there among equity research analysts, investment banks, that valuation doesn't matter. It's all about pricing. In fact, I'm going to read you a statement that I pulled off an equity research report written by Henry Blodgett, who used to be an equity research analyst in Merrill before he got in a lot of trouble about emails that got sent out about, you know, since has his own blog, he now views himself as an expert on valuation. He's actually a better blogger than he was as an equity research analyst. 
So here's what they took out. He said, valuation is often not a helpful tool in determining when to sell hyper growth stock. What? It's like a doctor saying whether you have a pulse or not is not that critical in determining whether you're alive or dead. But what he was trying to say was, hey, look, you know, these stocks, I don't care what the value is, it's all about pricing, it's all perception. And that's very deeply held. Many analysts, many investment bankers, many appraisers think that, the, that what you see as a price is determined by demand and supply, which is true, technically true, that it's all based on perception. People perceive something to be worth $100, it's worth $100. Who cares what the cash flows are, what the fundamentals are? And for some assets, that's true, right? Last year, that Munch painting, the screen sold for $120 million. And if I ask you, is this, is this worth $120 million? I mean, that's entirely based on perception. If tomorrow I woke up as a terrible painting of a strange person screaming, it gives me nightmares, I'll pay $10. There goes the value, right? So if you're talking about collectibles, about paintings, perception might be all that matters. But if you're buying an asset with cash flows, whether it be a bond, a stock, or a business, your perceptions have to meet up with reality, right? You can perceive whatever you want about Facebook's future, but the reality, if it doesn't deliver, is going to win out. So the point I'm going to make repeatedly through this is there's nothing wrong with pricing assets based on what other people are paying for them, but when that price starts to conflict with reality, you've got to keep your eye on that reality because sooner or later it's going to win out. So when you think about prices, it's true perceptions matter. Perceptions affect prices, but there's an underlying reality. What we're trying to do in intrinsic valuation is grapple with that underlying reality, even if it makes us uncomfortable. This is a postscript, the same stock on which he said it's not that helpful to look at valuation, that Internet Capital Group was trading at $3 one year after his equity research report. There was an underlying reality there, which is there's no business model ultimately shows up. As you watch Groupon's the Groupon fiasco unfold, you're seeing that potential conflict between what people perceive and what the underlying reality is. So here are, here are the, some very basic misconceptions about value that I want to set to the side before we start delving into valuation matters. Here's the first one. The first big misconception in valuation is when you do valuation, you're some kind of scientist looking for the truth, that you're an objective analyst widely held, right? You know what feeds into this? We sit in front of computers. We feed numbers into models. And after a while, we tell ourselves, hey, all I'm doing is entering numbers. There's no bias here. It's all the numbers. Let's be honest about this. There are no unbiased valuations. Each of you is going to pick a company, right, sometime in the next week. And you've already in your mind have a sense of what you think you're going to find. Don't fight it. It's reality. So if you pick Facebook, it's already because you've decided that it's vastly overpriced or vastly underpriced, and odds are you're going to find that out to be true at the end of the semester. I'll give you a story to kind of bring home how much bias can drive valuation. I valued Microsoft every year since 1986. That was the year of their IPO. Every single year I've done a valuation of Microsoft. Every single time that I valued Microsoft, I found it to be overvalued. You name the price, I found it overvalued at that price. $2, $5, $7, $10, $15. It's strange, right? One of the great success stories of US equity markets over the last 50 years, I wouldn't have touched it one step of the way. Now, I could give you access to every single valuation I've done, and you could dig through those models looking for clues as to why I found Microsoft to be overvalued, but to be looking in the wrong place. If you really want to know why I found Microsoft to be overvalued, all you have to do is take the elevator up to the ninth floor, walk up to my door. You don't even have to go in, because right there, there's a sticker on the door. The sticker is the sticker of an Apple. You walk in, and it's completely resolved. Every computer you see around me is an Apple. I've been an Apple user since 1981. To me, Microsoft has always been the Darth Vader of technology. Let me be specific. Darth Vader in episodes four, five, six, not Luke, you know, Luke Sky, not Anakin Skywalker, Darth Vader, but Darth, Darth Vader. And every time I sit down to value Microsoft, all the bad thoughts about Bill Gates, and lots of them come bubbling up to the surface. Because in valuation, you constantly come to forks in the road. If you don't believe me, you're going to come to these forks. Here's the first fork, high growth or low growth. 
And I value Microsoft. That's a no-brainer for me. Who buy this rotten product, low growth? High risk or low risk? You know, one virus away from blowing up, high risk. And by the time I make my choices and I get to the end of the process, guess what? I find Microsoft to be overvalued. And the more biased you are at the start of the process, the more your valuation is going to risk. Let me add to that proposition. You tell me who pays you to do a valuation and how much you get paid. I'll tell you which direction the bias is and how much the bias is. Let me tell you a story to bring this home. So about 20 years ago, a company called Lynn Cable, obviously a cable company, and AT&T had this option to buy 49% of Lynn Cable at an appraised value. So a publicly traded company, at and the option to buy 49% of that company at an appraised value. The time for the option to be exercised comes about. at and goes out and hires Morgan Stanley. So you guys are going to be Morgan Stanley. Your job is to value that 49% so I can buy it. So you work for at and the buyer. Lynn Cable goes out and hires Lehman Brothers. I'm sorry to do this to you, but think of yourselves as pre-bankrupt Lehman Brothers. And you're valuing the 49% so I can sell it. So you work for the seller, you work for the buyer. Two investment banks go to work on the valuation. Same company, same point in time, same information. One comes back with $105 per share. The other comes back with $155 per share. Now, who do you think came back with $105 per share? You did Why? Because you work for the buyer. You did your job. You came in with a low ball number. You came with a high ball number. And of course, you'd have 50 pages to back up your valuations. In fact, the numbers were so different, they decided to call in a third investment banker, who I said for two fees when you can have three, I guess. And they call in Wasserstein Perella. I'm going to say something incredibly harsh about these guys, but I mean every word of it. These guys couldn't value a $20 bill in a brown paper bag if you put it in front of them. They were masters at inventing multiples that nobody had seen before. Enterprise value to cash in the bag multiple, 3.3. Before you know it, you'd be paying $66 for a $20 bill and say, I feel good. That was a bargain. But if you're Wasserstein Perella, you're right in the middle there. Eh? You don't want to piss off either side too much. That's actually a finance term. What's the safest place for you to be? 105, 155? You want to go to 130, right? I'm going to let you in a little secret in valuation. Don't let it out of this room. If you're ever asked to value something, never, ever, ever come back with a nice round number. Don't tell me the target price is 40. Tell me it's $38.87. It's amazing what that second decimal will do in terms of creating an illusion. You actually know what you're doing. People step back. I'm not asking this guy questions. It's got the second decimal point nailed down. When in doubt, add decimals. And Excel, this is unlimited. You go 10 decimals, 15. The intimidation factor is overwhelming. What I'm trying to say in most valuations, the value gets set first, the valuation follows. <coughs> People decide what to pay, then they go looking for a justification for what they've already decided. It's not the way it's supposed to work, but it's reality. And the more bias you load into this process, the less point there is to doing valuation. What's the most biased process of all? I'll give you a clue. Some of the biggest valuations come out of this process. It's acquisitions. It's the most screwed up process you can think about. And here's what. You're my investment banker. I come to you with a question. I'm thinking about doing a deal. Should I do it? So basically, you grind through the numbers, and you can give me one of two answers, right? You can say, no, the deal looks too rich. Don't do it. In which case, what do you get? the undying gratitude of my stockholders, but try paying bonuses with that. Or you tell me, yes, the deal makes sense, in which case you make $100 million. This is like asking a plastic surgeon, is there something wrong with my face? <laughs> What's he going to say? No, you're perfect? Listen, this is their nose looks too big, his cheeks look too big. Mean, if your business comes out of finding something, of course you're going to do it. I think valuations and acquisitions are a waste of money and a waste of time. You know what the value of a target company is? It's whatever you've decided to pay for it plus $10. Why do we go through this charade of actually grinding out numbers to come to that conclusion? But that's exactly what happens when you add bias to the process. What killed equity research in the 1990s, and they still haven't recovered yet, 
I'm talking about sell-side equity research, the equity research you see from the investment banks, is they took a process as well that was already biased. <coughs> Why was it biased? You're an equity research analyst. You're going to track 12 companies for the rest of your life. That's already a depressing thought. <laughs> and you put a sell recommendation on a company. Guess what's going to happen? They're going to cut off all communication. They're going to shut you out. So already you have a process where as an equity research analyst, you're going to be more biased towards buys than sells because you've got to follow these guys for the rest of your life. In the 1990s, what was added to the process was equity research analysts were asked to bring an investment banking business in conjunction with being equity research analysts. I call it the Jack Grubman effect. You're taking a process that's biased and make it even more biased. Of course your valuations are going to suffer. I do valuations, but I see other people's valuations a lot more than I do my, do my own. For every valuation I do, I see 10 valuations that other people do. Whenever I look at somebody else's valuation, before I look at the numbers and dig through the assumptions, I ask two questions. Who did this valuation? Who paid them to do this valuation? In other words, I'm getting a sense of what the bias is before I look at the numbers. It's going to tell you a great deal more about how much you can trust that valuation than anything you might see in your numbers. So try that out. For the next few valuations you see, ask yourself, who did this valuation? What do they gain out of this valuation? Because that's where the bias comes from. Second big misconception about valuation. If I do a good valuation, I'm going to get the right answer. When does this get started? When you're about five, right? When you go to school for the first time, the teacher comes and puts a sheet of paper in front of you, two plus two. You get four. Congratulations, you got the right answer. You did everything right. You get any answer other than four. You must have screwed up. You got the wrong answer. And this gets drummed into you all the way through school. And God help you if you become an engineer or some kind of quant person, because then you get five more years of input-output. If you do things right, you get the right answer. And then you become an engineer. You discover they don't pay you that much. You come back to business school. How many recovering engineers are there in this room? So you pick a company, and you expect input output. If I do things right, I have to get the right answer. In the 25 years I've taught this class, like clockwork, I can predict what's going to happen around the 11th or the 12th week. About 15 or 20 people from this class, about 10% of the class, mostly engineers, will come to my office with their valuation. Come and put the valuation. I'm done with my valuation. Could you take a look and tell me whether I got the right answer? I don't even take a look at the valuation. I take it and give it back to them. I say, look. I don't know what the right answer is. And you can see the faith in the system start to crack. So you're teaching this class? You don't know what the right answer is? Think about it. If I knew the right value for every company, why would I be teaching this class? <laughs> there are far more lucrative things I could be doing, right? And you can see this group splintering at that, that stage. Half of them cannot deal with the fact that there's no right answer. Do you know what happens to them? They become fixed income people. I mean, let's face it, it's a lot more comfortable sitting there with a bond, right? The maturity is given, the coupon is given. You have to worry about default risk, but it's all in the denominator. The other half says, this is kind of fun. If you don't know what the right answer is, I can never, ever conclusively be wrong. Think about it. It's one of the great things about valuing equities. You can never, ever conclusively be wrong. You pick a stock, it goes down 31 years in a row. You know what you're going to tell me? Not a long enough time horizon. Or if it goes bankrupt, the system got in the way. That Lehman buy that you put out in 2007 would be looking great right now if only the system hadn't gotten in the way. I think it's a lot of fun not knowing what the right answer is, but then maybe I'm sick. There's a selection bias here. Equity valuation is not for everyone. You have to be able to deal with the fact that even if you do everything right, you do all of your homework, you collect all of the information out there, you're still going to be wrong 100% of the time. But here's the consolation prize. All you have to do is be less wrong than the rest of the market. It's a very different threshold. So what I'm trying to say is don't, at the end of evaluation, don't beat yourself up saying, I'm uncertain about this number. Guess what? It's not just you. Everybody's uncertain about that number. All you can do is make your best estimate you can with the information you have at that point in time. And one of the great ironies in valuation 
is the more uncertain you feel about the number, the greater the payoff to doing valuation. What am I talking about? Let's face it. You're going to be much more comfortable valuing Con Ed, a regulated utility, where you know pretty much everything that's going to happen for the future, than you are valuing Facebook, right? <laughs> so if I compare those two valuations in terms of precision, valuing Con Ed or Procter & Gamble is always going to give me a more precise answer than valuing Facebook. Then I ask yourself a follow-up question. If somebody else were valuing these companies, how comfortable would they be? And the answer is, anybody else valuing Con Ed or Procter & Gamble is going to be just as comfortable as you are because they see the same things. And most people valuing Facebook look at that uncertainty, and they don't even try. They give up. I'll wager that for every 100 investors who owns Facebook right now, including all of those institutional investors, 99 of them have absolutely no idea what the value of Facebook is. So how are they making the judgment? You know what they're doing? They're looking over their shoulder to see what everybody else is doing. That's why you get these complete panic attacks. That same equity research analyst who told you that Facebook was a great buy at 38, same guy, is now telling you it's a terrible stock at 18. Why? Because he's looking at everybody else and how they're behaving. This is that ultimate beauty contest, where essentially, rather than gauging what the stock is worth, you're making your judgments based on what everybody else is doing. And for young growth companies, companies where there's a lot of uncertainty in the future, most people don't even try. So if you can try and come up with a number, even if it's an estimate that is going to be wrong, you're 90% ahead of everybody else in this game because most people are not even trying. So don't measure the quality of evaluation by how precise it is. I'll give you the tools for actually coming up with the precision of evaluation. But I'm not going to judge you just because you have a big, I mean, if you're valuing a Greek company, guess what? Your valuation is going to be incredibly volatile. It's not your fault. Tell yourself that. It's not my fault. It's not my fault. You cannot make uncertainty go away by building a bigger spreadsheet or going for more information. Uncertainty is something you have to deal with and make the best judgment you can. Which brings me to the third and final misconception about valuation. If I make my model bigger, it's going to get better. And it's so easy to build big models now, right? You sell spreadsheets, you can build macros, you can put a crystal ball on top. And God help you if there's a team in the basement whose job it is to build <coughs> models for you. You know what I'm talking about? This is Geek City. There are five geeks, and they send them to the basement to build valuation models. And they love building models. They write macros on top of macros on top of macros. Inputs come in, they never leave. The model starts with 15 inputs, 25, 30, 50. Before you know it, they have a model to value a company that requires 85 inputs. Two things happen to these models. One is what I call input fatigue. If you've ever done valuation, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I'll tell you when it'll hit you. It'll hit you about 11 o'clock, 11 p.m., not 11 a.m., on a Saturday night. You're still at your desk. You're getting ready to shut everything down and go home. You're finally done. Your managing director comes and puts a 10K on your desk. I want this company valued on my desk first thing tomorrow morning. Why? It's Sunday morning. It's his trial by fire. He wants to see how much you really want this job. Part of you wants to exercise your option to abandon. I won't describe this option, but it's deeply satisfying when you exercise it. But they're deeply dissatisfying months afterwards. <laughs> so you think about it, but then you remember the car, the rental, all the stuff you have to pay. OK. And you sit down with that in-house model to value this company. You get to the 10th input. The clock strikes midnight. You're not Cinderella. You look down, there's 75 more inputs to go. Your stomach drops. Then you look at the 11th input. Says, what was the inventory five years ago? Part of you wants to go look it up, but that part's too exhausted to get out of the chair. The other part of you prompts you by saying, enter a random number. Let's move on. It's amazing how quickly the random numbers roll out, right? And the scary thing is when the output comes out, it all looks the same. That number you toiled hours over, and the random numbers all swim together. And here's another little secret in valuation. You want to hide your random number inputs. Guess what you should do? Create more detail in your output. Have 500 line items. People have no idea what's random and what's not. So when you see these valuations that run to 35 pages, the question you should ask yourself is, what are you trying to hide from me? Because good valuation should be parsimonious. The second thing that happens to these models is they become black boxes. 
you feed numbers and something happens, the number pops out on the other side. I'll tell you a story, and this is going to be a, 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 the last thing for the class, for the day. About 20 years ago, I remember a conversation I had with an equity research analyst at JP Morgan about a buy recommendation he'd put on a stock. <coughs> the target price of 85, the stock was at 35. The stock I was fairly familiar with, and I was curious as to how he came up with 85. So I asked him, how did he come up with 85? He said, I didn't do it. I said, what do you mean you didn't do it? Your name's on the report, it says 85? He said, I didn't do it. So who did it? He said, Value Mac did it. I said, who the heck is Value Mac? He said, that's our in-house valuation model. So what did you do, sneak into your office in the middle of the night, value the company, and leave it on your desk? But you know what he was trying to say, right? He was, I fed the numbers into this model. Something happened in the model. $85 pops out on the other side. Whenever you see the words, the model valued the company at, in any report, that's what the analyst is trying to say. Look, I didn't do it. The model did it. I sat there. I fed numbers to the model. The model asked me to go get a cup of coffee. I come back. It's already left. <laughs> so here's my, my deal with you. You can download any spreadsheet on my website to value companies. You can adapt it, adjust it on one condition. I don't want to see a final report from you saying that the modern model valued the company at $55. This is your valuation. Take ownership of it. Models don't value companies. You and I do. So if you're not registered in the class, I have a couple of sheets up, up in front that I would like you to come and fill out. Yeah.